Freedom from slavery. This is a Yom Kippur message, a message for the Day of Atonement. But it also concerns our everyday existence. It concerns everything we will do. It could affect you for the rest of your life. It should do. Hopefully it will do. I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. I'm speaking to you on behalf of Brit Am Hebrew Nations. Our organization shows that the Lost Ten Tribes are now to be found mainly amongst Western peoples. We research this subject and we have proven it. We have ample proofs and we have more that we have not yet published and God willing we will be enabled to publish and to put out and to propagate this information because it is very important and it concerns many people in the West today. And uh, now we are about to discuss Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is tomorrow. T tomorrow evening at the on the 25th of September 2012 begins the 10th day of Tishrei, the Hebrew day of Tishrei, which is uh, the seventh month of the year. But it is uh, the, the day on which we are counting as the beginning, as the beginning of the year for many, for many, uh, for judgment, for the, for the divine judgment, for how God, as if to say, rules the world. He begins, in a sense, on the month of Tishrei, in this month. The word Tishrei is connected to the Hebrew word Teshura, or Tesha. Tishura, that means gift. In other words, on this month, in this month we are given a free gift of life, a free gift of renewal of existence, as a free gift from the Almighty. Whether we deserve it or not, we are given another chance. And that is what is happening now. We have been given another chance uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the New Year's Day, on Rosh Hashanah, and now we are continuing this new chance and we are bringing it to a fulfillment. And this will happen on... Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. And this day is only my birthday, in, according to the Hebrew calendar. And it is a, a fast day, day in which observant Jews fast, and in the land of Israel, in the state of Israel, most of the secular Jews also fast. At least 70 to 80, say 70% of the people fast on this day. They do not eat or drink all day long, 24, 25 hours long. And uh, also there's hardly any traffic on the road, all the shops are closed and the whole country closes down. And this day, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement is mentioned in the Bible, in Leviticus 23, it says, verse 26, uh, Leviticus 23, 26, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, a day of gathering together. You shall afflict your souls, uh, actually you, your, your bodies, your, your minds and, and the offering, uh, an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall do no customary work on it and shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And this day, the day of atonement is a day of repentance. And uh, in the principle, we may uh, repent of our offenses and receive atonement any time. Any time is a good time. And any time God is open to receive our repentance. He wants it. God, as if to say himself, wants us to repent and return to him. Nevertheless, not every day, not every time is as good as another. Not, uh, not all times are the same. We know that. We know that from everyday life. Sometimes you wake up and you have a good day. Sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you're just mulling along and suddenly things, everything turns bad or, or the opposite. Everything turns good. Everything goes well. And we see that some times are more propitious than other times, so to this day is a little bit better, more propitious for repentance, for returning to God Almighty than other days are. Even though all times are good. And then on these days, if to say we can get through to God more easily than on other times. And also our repentance is more easily accepted on this day if we repent. God is if is always open to us, but on this day is even more open to us than the, the normal. Or we feel it more. It's easier. The day, there's something about the day that has a quality to it that we should take advantage of and uh, repent and go back and come back to God Almighty. And uh, all these lights need to repent, do good, and good will come to you. And this is a, a principle, this is a principle throughout the Bible. Do good and you will be blessed, do bad and you will be cursed. 
do that and evil will work before you. Evil comes to evil, good comes to good. And uh, God himself promises us this. In principle we should all do good because that is the right thing to do because good is worth doing for its own sake. But nevertheless, uh, God himself says that if we do good we will be rewarded. So we uh, are justified in bribing our physical beings as if to say that it is for our own good that we should do good. Should tell ourselves that if we do good, we will be blessed, things will go better for us, go better for our families, go, go better for those, those things that we believe in, for those people who want good to come unto. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what is, should be done. That through our merit, good will come to those we wish good to be done unto and including to ourselves. And uh, you can see it openly, you can see it openly most, most of the time, people who live good lives have it good. They are better, healthier, wealthier, happier. And there are exceptions. We have the Book of Job. The whole Book of Job is, speaks of exceptions. Job himself was a righteous person at the beginning. He was blessed and then he was cursed because God put him through a series of trials, of tests. And uh, Job was an exception and uh, we, all of us may endure periods of, of such exceptional testing times in our own life, but nevertheless the principle remains. Doing good brings reward. It brings reward both in this world and the next world. Evil endures punishment. And if we have sinned, then we deserve to be punished according to the Bible. But we may mitigate this punishment. We may modify it. We may reverse it. And even avoid it altogether and receive a blessing instead. And this is what happens when we repent and our sins are atoned for. This is the essence of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In order to achieve our atonement, we have to repent of our sins, we have to confess them to the Almighty, not to other people. Don't go around telling people what you've done. God does not necessarily want this, and it is counterproductive. Be careful of, uh, uh, you don't have to demean yourself, and you don't have to harm yourself. Because God wants the, your own good, and the good for you. But we should uh, acknowledge our sins before God Almighty, be it between ourselves and between Him. We should acknowledge what we have done and think of what we have done and think back of what we did wrong and, and how we should have done it, done better and how in the future if we ever get another chance we will not make the same mistake again we will do better than we have done before and we will endeavor to please God Almighty and to do what we think God will want us to do uh, this is what Yom Kippur is about this is what the whole day is about this is what we should think about and uh, on Yom Kippur, as I said, Jews fast all day long, and they abstain from work, and if you're not Jewish, you're not expected to do this. You can do this if voluntarily, if you so wish. It is not an obligation upon you, I've been in the meantime, even if you're descended from Israelites, in the meantime, you're not obligated by the law. In the future, you may well be. That is uh, another study, and it's uh, something that uh, has to be uh, considered and gone into. At the moment, we're living things as we are. Nevertheless, you can take advantage of these principles and apply them and eternalize them, and it is uh, good for you. And uh, at the end of Yom Kippur, when we finish fasting, when the whole day is finished, they blow the shofar. They blow the shofar. This is a remembrance of the shofar that the ram's horn was blown on Yom Kippur, or at the end of Yom Kippur in the Jubilee year. And the, the Jubilee year in Hebrew is called a Yovu. The Jubilee year fell on every 50th year at the end of a cycle of seven recurrences of the seventh year long sabbatical years. I'll explain. You had biblical times used to have six days of work, working in the fields. On the seventh year they had what is called a Shemitah, a sabbatical year, and they stopped working the fields, they left them fallow. And then at the end of the, the seventh year they went back to working. Uh, another six years, and they had the cycles of 49 years, 49 year, year, uh, 40, uh, 7 times 7 is 49, so 7 of, the, of these uh, 7 year cycles brought us to the end of the 49th year, and then the 50th year was a jubilee year, at least according to the, how we conventionally consider it, the uh, 50th year, jubilee year, and uh, this was a, a time of liberation. The Jubilee time was the end. It was a time of liberation. But the end of liberation did not take uh, it come into effect at the beginning of the year or on the New Year's Day on Rosh Hashanah. No, it came into be into effect at the end of Yom Kippur, ten days after the New Year's Day, ten days after Rosh Hashanah, at the end of Yom Kippur. 
led, there was a blowing of the shofar, and then all of the liberation uh, aspects connected with the Jubilee came into effect. And uh, so too, it was, uh, it was connected. It was connected, for instance, with uh, an indentured servant could go free. He could go free at, when, when the shop was blown, uh, but in a, in a, he did not go free free on the first day of the year, but on the at the end of the Yom Kippur, at the end of the tenth day of the year, he went free with a blowing on the shofar. But uh, in uh, in practice, from the beginning of the year for the for the for Rosh Hashanah, on the first day of the of the seventh month, he was he stopped work, prepared himself to be sent home to be sent free, and finally went free after receiving a bonus, after receiving gifts from his master from his former master and so on, then he went back to his uh, heritage. We find this in Leviticus 25.9, it says, And you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate this fiftieth day and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. And so too we are commanded on the tenth of Tishrei, that is Yom Kippur, the Jubilee, we are commanded to blow a shofar. As it says, and shall blow, blast a blowing shofar on the seventh month, on the tenth of the month, on the day of atonement, we shall pass a shofar throughout the land. The commandments involved in the Jubilee year, including the laws of Hebrew, identified to serve slaves, houses, and walled cities, and land consecrated to the temple, and devoted to the priests, by only when all of Israel dwells in the land of Israel. So it does not apply now, literally it does not apply now, but the principles remain. The principle, the spiritual sense remain, and God willing, or the practical effects will will um, will be applied in the future. And uh, we're talking about an Israelite indentured servant, or Hebrew slave. So uh, we've we had slaves in biblical times. In the Jubilee year, the Hebrew slaves should be set free. And we find in the Bible that there were slaves. So there were two types of slaves. Uh, what is called slaves. In Hebrew, the word for slaves is Evid. Evid uh, can mean slave or it can also mean servant. It can even mean a worker even. Or not a, a worker of it. An Evid is someone who works or is someone who is obligated to work. In spoken Hebrew, we use the word pole or uh, Sakhia, someone who's hired worker, and we have different uh, term, terms for that. But the term for um, slave, Ebed, uh, is not necessarily as harsh as it is in English. At all events, you had two types of slaves. You had the Ebed Kanani, Canaanite slaves, and uh, they were called Canaanite slaves, not because they were descended from Canaan, from the Canaanites, but because they were bought from the non Israelite peoples of the surrounding area from the land of Canaan, and um, they were acquired from these peoples, and they were non-Israelites, they were of non-Israelite uh, ancestry. And we find in Leviticus 25 verses 44 to 46, and it asks for your male and female slaves whom you may have from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you shall, may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you, and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them as a possession. They shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over them. You shall not rule over one another with rigor. A non-Israelite slave was someone who had to serve for you, serve his master, or serve, uh, it was your property. He had to serve you for all of his life. And also his children also were slaves, but and they were not supposed to be free. But if they were free, they automatically became full Israelite citizens, and they were obligated with all of the commandments. They had the same obligations and rights as any other Israelite. Also, if a, a non-Israelite, Ebed Kenani, was physically damaged, he could also be set free. It says in Exodus 21, verse 26. The man strikes the eye of his male or female slave servant and destroys it. You should let him go free for the sake of his eye. He knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant. You should let him go for the sake of his tooth. In other words, you are physically damaged. 
your non-Israelite slave, the person was free. And when he was free, he became a full-fledged citizen, as equal to you, with the same rights as you have, and the same obligations. So that is the first type of slave, the Canaanite slave. The other type of slave was a Hebrew slave, or Eret Ivri, actually the Hebrew servant, they're more like uh, servants, indentured servants, bonded servants, so obligated to work for six years. And uh, you became a uh, Hebrew uh, slave by going into debt and selling yourself, or being caught stealing and not having enough money to repay what you, were stopped, what you had stolen and, and, and destroyed, or lost. And uh, this was uh, it was uh, actually more humane than than, than jail. You would uh, you would uh, a, a, a Hebrew slave had to be treated well by its master. It had to be treated very well, in fact. It was uh, sometimes even better to be a Hebrew slave than to be an ordinary worker. And uh, in our present system, you think we we think we are so advanced, so so cultivated, so cultured, so civilized. Do you see what happens to people who get thrown into jail? All kinds of things happen to them. All kinds of troubles and tribulations pass over people who are imprisoned. And I'm not having mercy upon people, criminals who, who deserve to go to, to jail and things happen to them. But things do happen to people in jail. They should not happen. They should not be allowed to happen. They're treated very badly, uh, both by the jailers, both by the prison system and by their fellow prisoners. And, and this, this applies in Israel. And from what I understand, it applies even more so in the USA and elsewhere outside of Islam. Uh, and all kinds of horrible things happen to people who are thrown into jail, and, into, and, and uh, sometimes they are they're in jail. It happens that people are sent to jail for offences that they did not commit, or for offences that they um, should not go to jail for, or for offences that they shouldn't be punished for, but... Uh, that are serious, that have to, that society has to regulate, society has to punish, has to do something about, but they're not really, um, they're in a grey area, they're, they're, they're not really that bad in themselves, and it's a problematic uh, system, it's a problematic uh, situation, and the biblical solution was that many times, was someone who had been uh, sentenced or had uh, got himself in a situation where he had to work for six years. He had to work for six years and on the seventh year he would go free. We find this in Leviticus um, 25, Leviticus 25 verse 39 to 43. It says, and if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. You shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner shall be with you. You shall treat him like a hired help. And shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers, for they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with vigor, but you shall fear your God. So here we have, here where he works until the year of Jubilee. We have another verse, another another section where in Deuteronomy 15 verses 12 to 18 it says if your brother a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold to you and serves you six years in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you you shall not let him go away empty handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor and from your wine press, from what your Lord your God has blessed you with. You shall give it to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today, that if it happens that he says to you, will not go away from him because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl, like a, a kind of a um, nail, a sharp, uh, to, uh, uh, um, uh, a nail-like type, type instrument, which they use for making incisions in wood and stone, and leather. You shall take an oil, an awl, and... Um, Thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever, and also to your servant. So, my servant, you shall do likewise. You shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you. For it's been a, a double hired servant serving you six years, and your Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. So, we have here two different sources, and one says that they should go free in the year of Jubilee, the other says they should go free at the end of six years, but also says if at the end of six years he doesn't want to go away, you have to take an oil all and thrust it through his ear and to the door. So in effect what you would do if he did not want to go free at the end of six years, you would take his um take his all thrust it in a ceremony through through his ear to the door, then you would take it out, let him go, 
and he would serve you and continue to work with to you. He would continue to work to you until the end of the Jubilee. If the Jubilee year was the next year, then it's another year. If it was another 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, so, 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 so that was the case. So in other, in other words, if he wanted to continue to work for you beyond more than the six years required, the required six years, he would have to go through the ceremony and then he would work, to you, work for you until the Jubilee year and then he would go free and whether he wanted to or not and whether you wanted to or not you had to send him away and when you sent him away you had to send him away uh, with an extra with bounty with, with, with a bonus even if you had paid in advance for him to work for you when you sent him away you had to give him a, 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 a very generous uh, bestowal uh, I think it was about one third of what he would normally have worked for uh, or something like that there was a set rate and uh, you could always add to it and uh, this is uh, this was quite a humane institution or at least in theory at least in principle another thing about the jubilee year was that all ancestral lands would be returned to the families that owned them Leviticus 25 says and you shall count seven families of years for yourself seven times seven years and the time of the seven sevenths of years shall be to you 49 years then shall cause the trump trump trumpet, in other words, the shofar of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the date of atonement, you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. You shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land, and to all its inhabitants it shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. So when the Israelites conquered the land of Canaan, it was divided amongst the tribes. Each tribe then in turn divided its portion to each of the families. These family portions were passed from father to son. They could not be sold permanently, they could only be sold until the Jubilee year. And uh, the Jubilee year, each ancestral portion will return to the family that who, whom it belonged to, whom it originally belonged to. In other words, every 50 years, or the land was redistributed and went back to its original owners. And this would not happen at the, at the end of, of the 49th year, or at the very beginning of the 50th year. It would happen on Yom Kippur, when the shofar would be blown. The servants would be set free, the lands, ancestral lands would be restored to their families. And nowadays the Jubilee law year is not celebrated, because in order for the Jubilee year to be celebrated, they need to have all of the tribes on their land according to their families. And and the ten tribes, the majority of the Israelites have been lost, they've lost, they've been lost, we don't know where they are. We, we, Brit Am, researches and says that we know approximately what areas they are to be located in, but we cannot point to individuals and say we're sure 100% that this person or that person is descended from Israelites, we can only say that there's a good high proportion of people in certain areas are descended from Israel, and so the statistical probability that people who come from those areas and feel that they do descend from Israelites indeed to do so. This is what our organization, Bidam Hebrew Nations, does. We research this and we provide evidence concerning it. And in the future, this will all be cleared up. We will know who belongs to these, who is descended from Israelites. The Israelites will return, and even now, the process has begun. There will be now rows amongst the sense of Israelites, and that the knowledge of the Israelite ancestry will be known to them. And, um, and the eventual the liberation, the redemption of the ten tribes and also of Judah, of the remnant, remnant of Judah will be, will come about and it is uh, likened to the blowing of a, sh of a shofar, of a trumpet, it translated as trumpet actually, shofar, ram's horn, and Isaiah 27 says, so it shall be in that day, the great shofar shall be blown, and they will come who are about to perish, in other words, the, the word translated as perish is actually obdim, obdim, in Hebrew it means those who were lost or were being lost in the land of Assyria and they who were outcast in the land of Egypt and they shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. This is referring to lost ten tribes. The lost ten tribes were exiled to Assyria and they lost consciousness of their identity. And uh, they are still being lost. Every day that their descendants are not aware of their ancestry, they do not know that they descend from Israel, is, if, uh, is a further loss. It's a loss to the Israelites and it's lost to these people in, in, uh, who are affected by it. And uh, they are being lost, and we, we but our human nations wants to find them and help them find themselves. And uh, by doing this, we too shall find ourselves. The Almighty will make Himself found to us through this, through this task that we have received upon ourselves, and that we are endeavouring to fulfil, and that we need your help to fulfil it. 
And uh, the outcast in the land of Egypt, this refers to the Jews uh, from Judah. They were also cast out of their land and now they have been beginning to return. And they, they were cast out of the land, but they did not lose consciousness. They did not lose awareness of their, of their ancestry. And they too will be liberated from the bondage of exile. And it says they were outcast in the land of Egypt. And the word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, Berenice Mitzrayim which can mean Egypt, did mean Egypt, but it also has additional applications. It can also refer to Russia and to Eastern Europe and to other areas. And uh, this part of the blessing is being fulfilled because um, a good portion of the Jews are now already began to return to the land of Israel and they're resettling it. And they should be helped to do so because this is the will of God Almighty. And we may uh, understand this uh, verse Isaiah 27, 13 to be saying, in that time a great shovel shall be blown, and the ten lost tribes who were exiled by Assyria and are still being lost in, in, in their exile, they shall return, and the Jewish captives who were scattered to Egypt, to Russia, Eastern Europe, and elsewhere shall return, and they shall all worship the Almighty God of Israel on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And this is what we should do, and this is what we should endeavor to do, and look forward to doing, and believe this is what eventually will be done. This is what the Bible says. And uh, to do this, we have to listen to the shovel being blown and understand in, in, in a spiritual sense, and the, the, this bomb of the shepherd concerning the return of the ten tribes and the re, concerning uh, the, the return of Judah is, uh, is uh, quoted several times in the prayer service for Yom Kippur. We all need to repent. And repentance includes helping to bring about the principle of the Jubilee year, and this uh, includes helping the sense of the ten tribes know who they are and where they are and what there is required of them. This is what we do, this is what Britain and Hebrew Nations does. Bid Am is helping us Israelites from the ten tribes and also from Judah to become conscious of their Hebrew ancestry and their identity. We're helping to, them to prove that they are Israelites and to remain conscious of it and its significance. And this is connected with the Jubilee year and with the repentance. And repentance therefore includes you doing your part as well. You repenting, you returning to God Almighty, but also helping Bid Am. Also assisting us by helping us with funds, helping us with... Uh, support uh, being with us, be, uh, identifying with us and following what our researchers. And uh, another aspect is that repentance also means real realizing that we have been acting as slaves, a a as, as people who, who all of us are affected, uh, we have this slave mentality that we are bound to act in certain ways that the society around us obliges us to do so. And uh, this has caused us to depart from God Almighty, to depart from our Hebrew consciousness. To, to, to abandon, abandon biblical awareness, we need to return. We need to free ourselves. This is what Yom Kippur is about, freedom. It's about liberation. Liberation means coming back to God Almighty. Liberation means accepting the, the yoke of the Bible. Liberation means believing in the Bible. Liberation means becoming an Israelite, being aware of your Israelite ancestry. And uh, that also means helping Britain, Hebrew nations, helping us. We are on your side. We are your ally and your helper. You should help us to help you and to help others like yourselves. This is important and this is part of what you can do and what can be done. And this is all connected with the principle of Yom Kippur and of freedom from oppression, freedom of oppression of circumstances, freedom of oppression of exile, freedom of the oppression of having lost our, our identity. We have to regain our Israelite identity to become aware of it and to learn about it and to enable others also to become aware of it. Thank you very much. This is Yair David. I've been speaking to you from Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and I've been speaking to you on behalf of Brit and Hebrew Nation.